tonight really excited i think this one's a little different than anything we've had thus far so um choosing age appropriate strength and conditioning options for for minor hockey players and i think um in my experience and just communications with uh, lots of people within hockey edmonton is just this is an aspect that we're all looking for a little bit more of advice and, and guidance on and uh um reached out to joel jackson our guest tonight and uh, uh i think is a, a great person to to start this topic with with us and uh joel is the uh, strength and conditioning coach with the bears and the pandas at uh university of alberta um obviously he's done an amazing job there and has won a number of national championships and both sides a uh, female and male of the game and he's also a part owner of competitive threads so lots of knowledge as well just with on ice testing off ice testing and how we can combine all those to again um, push our programming to the next level so uh, i would just ask that uh, with questions um, we can submit them into the group chat as we go or um, just we'll have them at the end just for a little bit and we can manage the questions that way um, but other than that i'm going to turn it over to to joel here um, thanks again for coming, Joel, and preparing a presentation, and we're looking forward to it. So thanks again. And thank you for having me. Let me know when I'm good here, Joel. Yep. Yeah. yeah, you got your, your PowerPoints up. There you go. You did. Perfect. Okay. So yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me, Joel, and, and thank you, everybody, for for um, coming here on St. Patrick's Day. And like I, I mentioned in my old post there, if you're sucking back on a Guinness right now, that'd probably be a good way to enjoy this or a green beer if you got some green dye at home. But uh, as uh, as was mentioned, the, the title of this presentation will be choosing age appropriate strength and conditioning options for minor hockey players. Um, so kind of just uh, a little bit more about me. Um, I have a master's in strength, uh, master's in exercise physiology, sorry. Uh, that I attained at the University of Alberta uh, in 2014. Uh, I did my, my thesis, so my, my research on time motion analysis and heart rate response to female varsity hockey games. And we also published, uh, like myself, along with my supervisor, published some research that was collecting the same data on the male side as well. Uh, I'm a certified strength and conditioning specialist through the National Strength and Conditioning Association. And then I'm also uh, recently, uh, just last week, actually finished my precision nutrition level one certification as well. Uh, with my hockey background, um, <clears throat> I, I grew up in northern Manitoba in a, in a small town called Snow Lake. Um, I played minor hockey there, obviously, growing up, uh, AAA midget, and then I played my junior A hockey in, in the MJHL as well. Came out to Alberta to play at Augustana. In the ACAC, where I spent five years there, really enjoyed my time so much. I married a girl from Camrose and uh, moved up to Edmonton with her, and this is where I reside now. So, uh, up here, as as mentioned, I, I'm part owner of a company called Competitive Threat Athlete Testing and Development, uh, where we do a number of different things through there. My role that is more through the beyond ice testing side of things and strength and conditioning, and then also at the U of A, where I have the the men's and women's hockey teams, as well as the wrestling, swimming, and men's volleyball programs that I oversee their strength and conditioning needs. <clears throat> so what I kind of want to accomplish with this presentation today is address certain myths and misinformation surrounding resistance training uh, that some of you may have came across, particularly in youth, uh, establish when it is ideal to start strength and conditioning, and how it should change as the player's age. Um, ideas to get strength and conditioning programs in place with your your teams and then team teams child children whatever it is that you're on this call today to kind of find more out about and then the hope is that in, this information is valuable to you as coaches uh, of young players and then as parents as well and then definitely try to leave some time at the end for some questions and answers and then as joel mentioned um, feel free to kind of post them in the chat as i go so is resistance training safe? So these are just a few questions that I've heard or some of you may have heard along the way. So one is stunt their growth. Uh, is there a risk of fracturing growth plates? I've heard that it can injure their joint or hurt their joints. So um, the biggest thing is like a lot of these things are unfounded. Okay. So, and, and the information that I'll, that I'll have in some of this presentation will hopefully support that. Um, so I, uh, I promise this will be the only slide that I'll throw pictures of my son in there. So 
this is my son Bodhi. Um, and just just to establish that I don't have him on like a regimented strength and conditioning program yet. I'm not like a crazy person or anything. But uh, you know, one thing though is like I I do think it's important that um, I expose him to what I do, right? So pre-COVID era, I'd like to bring him into the gym with me. Um, especially on the weekends, right? If, uh, if there was, uh, you know, Alicia or my wife was working at, uh, working on the weekend, I could bring him into the gym with me, let him run around. And then at home, I have like a little setup in the basement, have that little bar for him to play around with. Um, and just, you know, let him know that it's normal. Right. And, and I kind of expose them to stuff earlier on. I'm not getting them to, you know, put a bunch of weight on the bar or anything like that, but it's, it's something that can definitely be important is exposing, kids to exercise and, and different things like it's like very early in life. Okay. Um, another kind of story that I wanted to tell on this slide is that when I, I can remember when I was young growing up that I had like a, a very keen interest in weight training and exercise very early in life. So I remember going to my dad when I was probably like 11, 12 in that neighborhood and asking him if I could start training with weights. And from, from what he, his information that he got from somebody that he trusted, they had told him that it wasn't safe for me to start training with weights until I was 13. Right. So again, something like that, largely unfounded and kind of the, the thing that I've come to support is that, especially if it's in a situation where if you find that a kid is showing genuine interest in weight training, then it's safe to start with them. Right. Provided that it's done the right way. Okay. And again, hopefully give you some good information that will give, like, give you an idea of what it is to do it the right way. Okay. So what does the research say? So with my, my bit of academic background, I'm not, I'm not an academic by any means. Like I don't have my PhD or, or anything, but I've always spent a lot of time in the, in the university setting. So I'll definitely try to throw some research in there and kind of back it up with it. So this piece right here uh, is a position statement from the governing body that I have my strength and conditioning uh, certification through. And particularly those first two names on there. So Fagenbaum and Kramer are probably two of the most well-respected uh, researchers in the kind of exercise science area uh, by far. Okay. And uh, Avery Fagenbaum especially has done an astronomical amount of research on youth resistance training and is a, a massive advocate, advocate of, of how safe it is and how effective it is and how necessary it is really. <clears throat> okay, so there was presumptions in the 70s and 80s that resistance training was unsafe for youth. And this was based off data collected from various like emergency room visits in, in the US related to exercise and exercise equipment. Okay, so uh, it's important here to recognize that these injuries were related to the exercise and exercise equipment that these people came in injured from not caused by it, okay? So a direct quote out of this article is, in fact, many of the reported injuries were actually caused by inappropriate training techniques, excessive loading, poorly designed, uh, poorly designed equipment, ready access to the equipment, or lack of qualified adult supervision, okay? All things that um, I've often seen be a big issue in areas where it might have been unsafe. So although these findings indicate that the unsupervised and improper use of resistance training equipment may be injurious, it is misleading to generalize these findings to properly designed and supervised youth resistance training program. Okay. Another piece here uh, that some people have used to kind of back up the claim of youth resistance training being unsafe is some research from China conducted probably in the same area where they're basically looking at um, children working very strenuous manual labor jobs in certain rural regions of China and correlating that to stunted growth. Okay. So again, very contextual, right? It's like, where are you applying this information? Where are you getting this information from? Where are you applying it to? So that's not really fair for, for some of these things to be applied to what a good sound type of resistance training would be for a, a young kid. Okay, so kind of looking on like some actual like science data behind injuries that occur in weightlifting or resistance training. Okay, so a study looking at high school age youth reported that there's a total of 1,576 injuries over a one year period. Okay, looking across a number of different high school sports. 
Resistance training resulted in 0.7% of those injuries. Okay. Looking at some of the other sports, football, 19%, basketball, 15%, soccer, 2%. Okay. So with those some ones being like some of the more popular sports where there's more kids participating in some sports such as wrestling and gymnastics, when you kind of corrected for that um, ratio of participation, those showed some higher injury rates as well. Another kind of qu another quote out of that article. So in general, injuries related to resistance training in high school athletes appear to involve the aggressive, the aggressive progression of training loads or improper exercise technique. OK, so something kind of popping up there again is a common theme, right? It's like if if there are injuries that occur, there's usually a reason for it and it's usually avoidable. OK. OK. Kind of looking more a little closer at hockey all right so oftentimes injury rates are reported by the occurrence of per 1000 hours okay so risk per 1000 hours in different sports is going to range from 0 0.04 to 127.3 okay so that's directly out of this sphinx and mcclure article so reported numbers for youth uh, youth ice hockey are in the nine to ten year range 1.12 for every thousand hours and you can see as it goes up as the kids get older, okay? For obvious reasons, the game gets faster, the bodies are bigger, all right? That kind of equates to a little bit higher chance of injury, okay? Reported numbers for resistance training are 0.12 per 1,000 hours, okay? So by no means, like, am I trying to, uh, you know, make, make ice hockey look dangerous or any of these other sports look dangerous, but I guess the big point here is that there's an inherent risk with pretty much anything that you're doing in terms of sport. All right. And when you look at all these different sports across the board, resistance training, your chances of getting injured, injured in it are, are much, much lower than pretty much everything else. OK. And like the one thing I usually like to bring up in this, is, you know, if we were in a setting where I could have people raise their hands, it'd be a little bit different. But um, what the, the sport that people get the most injured in across any age group anywhere in the world is long distance running. OK, and that being the reason for that is it's like, what's the first thing somebody's going to do when they say they want to get in shape, right? They're going to get outside and they're going to start running. OK, and typically that is uh, a very high chance of different types of overuse injuries, right? So you're not going to hurt yourself seriously, but the chances of you getting injured are, are always very high. OK, so take home message here. As long as the resistance training program is designed the right way, supervised the right way, all right? The kid is going through it properly with good technique. It is very, very safe, okay, regardless of the age. Okay, there's an overwhelming amount of evidence, evidence that it's not, that not only resistance training is safe, but if done properly can actually dramatically reduce the risk of injury. Okay, so that's another part that really needs to be paid attention to and really kind of given its due. All right, and one of the biggest, the things that I always like to say is a strong athlete is a robust athlete. Okay, robust meaning that you're going to withstand that grind of a, however many game season you might be in with your teams, right? So as, as kids advance to the higher and higher levels, there's more and more games, right? When you're looking at WHL and junior hockey, it's, it's a grind, right? And if you are prepared for it physically, there is a lot less chance of, of, of injury, okay? And that's, that's always, that's 100% true. Okay, so moving on for here. So this is a, a little bit, a little bit of uh, happening with these diagrams here. Okay, but they're they're taken out of the like long-term athlete development article by two research two researchers by the name of Lloyd and Oliver, and this is from 2012. So this is uh, an article that I've um, went to quite a few times when I've talked about this topic because it, it does a very good job of summarizing all the different things involved in a in a kind of proper these these guys refer to it as a youth physical development model but many of you have probably heard it as LTAD or long-term athlete athlete development so just kind of quickly going through this um, kind of continuum here going down the left side you have chronological age and years all right going from two all the way to 21 age period so early childhood middle childhood adolescence into adulthood their growth rate so rapid growth steady adolescence spurt and then decline in growth rate maturational status so years pre phv so phv is standing for peak height velocity peak height velocity is just what it sounds like what your your kids growth spurt is okay and that is often coinciding with most of the population with their peak weight velocity as well 
Okay, so that's something you're going to see a little bit more uh, with boys, okay, where they're going to get puberty, put on more muscle, gain some more lean mass, all right, and just have a, have a much easier time putting on weight. Okay, training adaptation, so predominantly neural, age-related, transitioning into combined of neural and hormonal maturity-related, okay, so neural-related earlier on. Pretty much anybody that starts a strength and conditioning program or some types of resistance training program, they're going to see big gains in their strength right off the bat without any kind of change in the actual physical nature of the body. They won't really necessarily put on a whole bunch of muscle right away. Those early gains in strength are always neural, all right? So that's your nervous system kind of nervous system based, basically becoming more efficient, you learning the skills of the movement, that type of thing. As they kind of reach that peak weight velocity, things start to happen more with the, the testosterone in males, especially, all right, where uh, there's, there's more of that actual muscle hypertrophy or muscle, muscle building in the body that is accounting for that strength gain, okay? Then the physical qualities. So going down the list here, FMS is standing for fundamental movement skills. SSS is standing for sports specific skills, mobility, agility, speed, power, strength. Hypertrophy, again, a fancy word for, for putting on muscle. Endurance and MC, so MC standing for metabolic, condi metabolic conditioning. And then training structure, okay? Going from unstructured all the way up to very high structure when the athlete reaches adulthood. So with the blue, all right, this is what the model looks like for males, okay? And then if I go to the next slide, this is what it looks like for females. All right, so maybe maybe a little bit maybe a little bit sexist with the colors for, uh, on these guys and the, that made this document, but uh, I guess it works. But either way, if I just kind of toggle back and forth between these, you can see where the difference lies. Okay, so when we look at the female one, there's during the prepubertal years, boys and girls follow similar rates of development and growth and maturation and therefore can follow similar training programs, all right? So up until that kind of middle late childhood when uh, an athlete will typically hit that puberty phase, training programs can look exactly the same. And most of the times, any of you that have dealt with that age population, it's, it's you often see that there's not really a lot of difference in terms of, of how they're gonna respond to any type of training stimulus either. So typically the onset of adolescent growth or that growth spurt is going to occur a little bit earlier in girls. Okay. So typically two years earlier in females. So around 10 years of age and then boys are usually going to hit it around 12 years. Of age, all right. Despite an earlier attainment of that peak height velocity or the peak weight velocity in the girls, the magnitude of the growth spurt is always going to be a little bit higher in boys. Okay. And one of the biggest reasons for that is that higher level of circulating uh, testosterone. Okay. And then again, as we all know, this isn't something that's set in stone, right? You're going to see like different, different kids are going to hit their growth spurts at different ages. There's a ton of variability, variability there. Okay. Um, so with that in mind, there has to be adjustments made in terms of this model, right? When you're applying it to your situation, it's something that kind of needs to be a little bit more fluid. Okay. Um, so for a late mature, the model is going to shift to the right. Okay. So you're just going to delay things a little bit more. For an earlier mature, it's the opposite. You're going to shift everything a little, a little bit to the left on this model, all right, where you can start things a little bit earlier. Okay, just to kind of quickly go over, so fundamental movement skills. Um, in terms of terminology here, there's there's a, a different governing bodies will have different ways of, of communicating it, but typically it's something along these lines. So body control, locomotion and object control, okay? Um, <clears throat> so body control being things like agility, balance, excel, et cetera, locomotion, running, jumping, swimming, object control, so sending, receiving, so things like throwing and catching, dribbling, striking, kicking, okay? All different types of fundamental movement skills that can be applied across a, a number of different sports. <clears throat> Okay, so the biggest thing I kind of want to kind of call attention to on this model is when we look at the strength. Okay, so uh, in terms of like you can you probably caught on with this model is that like as the the font size decreases, that is representative of the focus on it kind of being less of a concern. Okay, so this model will kind of point to being strength is strength is king, right? So it, it always needs to be a, a pretty pretty heavy focus, but that's going to look very very different across these different age groups. Okay. Um, but definitely that's, that's one thing that I kind of wanted to bring into these next couple slides because 
with these first three sayings on here, this is something that I've heard many, many times across every single age group. Okay. So, um, so-and-so needs to get faster. So-and-so needs quicker feet. So-and-so has slow boots. All right. It's always about speed. Rightfully so. Right. And the kind of thing is like the lightning McQueen there. I am speed, speed kills, right? Everybody wants to be the fastest player on the ice, but the biggest thing is that strength, sorry, speed is born from strength. Strength needs to be your base that you build everything else off of. Okay. Um, so it's the kind of thing that with the players that I work with on the, on the bears and pandas, right. Where, you know, a, a bear is coming in as a rookie at a, at a 21 year old, typically with four or five years of junior hockey under his belt. Uh, a panda is a little bit younger, you know, as, as an 18 year old, but will typically have some pretty good strength and conditioning experience. So with them, um, you know, when, when speed is the, goal there things are going to look a little bit different in terms of their training right it's still very well could be the case where they're not strong enough and that needs to be the focus all right but that is kind of the age group when you can start manipulating and looking at things a little bit differently oftentimes some people might describe it as the training would be like a little bit sexier or like a little bit more involved right but um a kid I, if you're looking at somebody and saying like hey this this kid this player needs to get faster but they've never trained with weights before, they need to get stronger, right? And that will like 100% of the time translate to get them getting faster, okay? That's where it needs to start all the time. You're not gonna get out there and try to do all sorts of super like um, involved, very, very highly difficult types of training methods that would be classified as like speed power development. So looking at like really high impact jumping exercises and, you know, trying to get the kid directly into doing like Olympic lifting or anything like that. It's just very, very basic stuff off the bat. And, and that's going to work the best the majority of the time. Okay. So just kind of highlighting the importance of strength with a couple of the highlights from those, a uh, couple of direct quotes from those articles that I brought up. So there are close associations between muscular strength and running speed, muscular power, change of direction, speed, plyometric ability, endurance, okay? So a ton of different qualities kind of uh, tying into that strength, right? So if you think about it as a pyramid, the strength's the base, right? The strength that, that everything can be built up, build upon, okay? Um, it is now accepted that the risk of sports-related injury in youth can be reduced by regularly engaging in an appropriately designed strength training program that is super, supervised by appropriately qualified personnel, okay? So again, some of the, the biggest things here is just making sure that you, you have the right people in place delivering the program. Uh, approximately 50% of overuse injuries within youth sport, okay? So again, Something that's going to come up with, with a lot of different higher volume type of training is just overuse injuries. So that, that's our things like our hamstring pulls, our shin splints, types of things like that. Could be preventable in part with appropriate preparatory conditioning. However, it must be stressed that strength development sessions should not be simply viewed as an addition to a young athlete's development program, but as a replacement for another form of training. Okay, so it's like that kind of getting to the point where you just don't want to pile it on top of everything else you're doing. It needs to take an important spot in your kind of training calendar, in your plan, right? Um, it just needs to have its own place. Okay, um, so what about conditioning? So this is something like, you know, I could probably go through a whole other hour presentation just on just on this, right? Like focus one just on kind of strength training and one just on conditioning. Um, but I'll just kind of try to summarize it in this one slide here. So the big thing here that I kind of find in, in a lot of uh, people that that run strength and conditioning programs in the in the private setting is that you find that a lot of parents and coaches want they want their athlete to, to be tired, right? The that's the that's kind of the indication that there was a good workout or the, the coaches did a good job. If the athletes like bag, tired, sweating, you know, puking, whatever it might be, whatever it might look like for you, but tired isn't always better. Okay. Better is better. So everything doesn't have to be hard and grueling. Everything has to have a purpose. Okay. So a hundred percent, there are times where it is very, very effective and very, very valuable to really push the limit. But if you're doing that day in and day out every single day, that is a recipe for disaster every single time, all the time, okay? So you just have to be purposeful with it, 
whether whatever it is that you're planning to do in terms of conditioning okay so with a hockey player they need to be very well rounded in terms of their energy system okay or energy systems i should say so all of us have every single person has three different main energy systems okay so we have a a phosphocreatine system a glycolytic glycolytic system and an aerobic system okay so the phosphocreatine system is something that you're going to use for very very short efforts like doing a, a maximal one rep bench press, um, a 50 meter sprint, that is your, that is your phosphocreatine system. Glycolytic system is something for something a little bit more longer, but still very high intensity. Okay. So something like just a, a 30 second sprint up these stairs that I'm on right here. Okay. That would be very glycolytic in nature. Okay. And then aerobic is, is the type of thing where you're, you're expending energy for a longer period of time. Typically two minutes or longer is what they'll put it at. Okay. But no matter what you're doing. So me right now, you guys right now sitting down, you're using all three energy systems, but the aerobic one is dominant. All right. So if you were going to get out and sprint out of your house, cause it was on fire, you'd have to use another one that would be dominant. Okay. But all three of them are always in play at each time. So with anaerobic, the, that's what we're using. And that's, that's the biggest thing was the, our, our ability to produce speed, power, high intensity efforts, obviously a very important thing for hockey players. All right. The, the time where people get lost there is it's not the only thing that's important for a hockey player. Okay. When they're on the shift, when they're sprinting and they're on the ice, yes, very anaerobic. But when we look at the aerobic energy system, the ability to recover between high intensity efforts, the ability to recover between shifts, the ability to recover between periods, the ability to recover between games. Okay. That is all your, your ability to recover is directly correlated to the fitness of your aerobic energy system. Okay. So when we're looking at this, a balanced approach is always best. All right. So I'm sure many of you on this call have heard the term periodization before, or just like planning certain training. Okay. And that, that's the type of thing. There, there's certain times of the year where a focus on anaerobic is going to be a little bit better and a focus on aerobic is a bit better. All right. So if I give you an example right now with my university hockey players right now with the, the year being the way it was, right. And there's not going to be any competition until September, kind of October of next year. Now would be the perfect time to focus a little bit more on the aerobic piece. Okay. So aerobic energy system can be similar to what I described strength as where it's kind of the base that you can build the rest of those energy systems off of. Okay. So it's definitely not something, and, and I've heard people, I, I haven't seen this as an issue as much, but I've heard other coaches that I follow and communicate with talk about how certain teams, parents will, will put their kids into long distance running or cross country running in order to kind of stay in shape. And that would not be my recommendation to do something like that. Okay. So when we look at that type of training, so the aerobic training, it's, it's good, it's, ne it's necessary, but you don't want to like overfill that bucket. All right. So as a hockey player, you have a number, like a whole bunch of different buckets that you need to kind of expend your energy across. If you overfill one, you're taking away from other things that you could be adding to, right? So if you spend way too much time on aerobic conditioning, that's probably going to translate to you getting slower on the ice. All right. You might be able to recover really well, but at the same time, you don't want to sacrifice any speed or power. Okay. So it's just being mindful of it, being careful with of it, of it, trying to have a balanced approach. So what I'll do on these slides here is go through all the different age categories. And this was one thing when, when I was discussing with Joel about how it would kind of work best, I, I was kind of racking my brain, how to kind of make it um, applicable across the board to all the different coaches and all the different age categories. So this is kind of what I want to do is I'm going to start at initiation, take a look at each age group and how it might look. Okay. So each one of these, I'm going to ha have these headings in here for structure, focus, tools, and ideas. Okay. And hopefully this will kind of help you guys, you know, uh, come up with some ideas, come up with some plans. If, you, if you're somebody that wants to start implementing a little bit more of the off ice approach. So the structure, um, looking at that, going back to that big graph that I had up from the Deloitte and Oliver article, unstructured for this age. Okay. U7s, you know, I, I'm sure you all know it's, it's a lot of times going to be like herd and cats. And uh, the one thing that uh, I put our young son into sport ball. So that was like a really good example of what something might look like for these kids, right? It just needs to be unstructured, fun, but involve some of the fundamental movement skills. So focus, 
fun and games that involve FMS, okay? Trying to find creative ways to do that. So tools, <clears throat> this is, this is Nage, you might want to use some agility ladders, okay? So um, I'm sure most people know what those are. Uh, one of the biggest myths about those things is that they're actually used to train agility, all right? Okay, so that they're much, they're a much better tool for incorporating into a warm up or teaching athletes coordination coordination and different types of like hand foot coordination and that type of thing so they're they're valuable right as long as they're used in the right setting okay so agility ladders balls cones for the different types of, of tools that you might use um obstacle courses right try to be creative and set up some sort of ob obstacle course uh where they have to jump and roll and and do all sorts of different kind of fun things and kids kids will have a blast with that type of stuff relays soccer dodgeball Maybe trying to take the kids to like a gymnastic studio or something right now. Probably not a big reality in the in the moment that we find ourselves in. But you know, hopefully we get back to normal soon and you're able to do stuff like that. But just taking them to places where um, they can do that type of stuff and just kind of let loose and try to have a, a little not structure, but just try to have a why behind it. All right. So try to have have them introducing some of those fundamental movement skills um, and in disguised in games and kind of fun types of things. So. Anybody that wants some ideas, Jeremy Frisch. So that name right there, if you uh, search that guy's name on social media, he's kind of the whiz guru when it comes to this types of age groups with the youth training. And he does, he does some very, very creative stuff, very, very cool stuff and has a, an excellent philosophy for training the young age groups. Moving on to novice. Okay, so unstructured to low structure so again it might you this is your opportunity to maybe just add a little bit more to it so still fun and games that involve the fundamental movement skills but start to sprinkle in some very basic body weight strength work okay agility ladders again balls body weight in terms of some of the strength work uh, ideas here so obstacle courses relays soccer dodgeball and strength soft breaks okay so what i mean by that is that say you had a 45 minute session with these kids in like a gymnasium somewhere and you had a whole bunch of different games and relay set up strength soft breaks would just be like taking a three to five minute period at different points throughout that session to just do maybe teach them how to squat teach them how to do some push-ups a plank a wall sit some very very basic stuff sprinkled in right because these are still kind of the age group where you're probably going to lose them pretty quick if you try to add too much structure to it. So just sprinkle it in very, very casually. Okay. And then one thing that I should mention too, it's like with, with those first two age groups, it's like, if you want to pursue somebody to run those types of sessions for you, um, great. I, I know that there is some people out there that, that kind of are, are trying to make that a bit of a niche for themselves, but at the same time, it's something that you could very, very easily do on your own as a coaching staff, right? Uh, and it's probably best in a lot of situations because you already have those kids, uh, they know you, they know you're kind of an authority figure and, and you can kind of help uh, keep them, you know, together and focused. Uh, with Adam, U11, so low structure here still, okay, but, but still, um, you know, having a little bit in there involving more strength, sprinting, agility, flexibility, mobility to the sessions. Okay. So if you think back to that continuum, this is when some of those, those words were becoming a little bit bigger in font size and needed to be a little bit more of a focus. So continue to include fundamental movement skills, but to a lesser degree than that initiation novice group. Tools, again, leaving agility ladders in there, body weight, sandbags, cones mini hurdles okay so i have a picture on the bottom there of these sandbags so there's a number of different brands of them uh they're an awesome tool to introduce young kids to resistance training okay picture on my next slide will kind of give you a, a better bit of a better reason why that is but these things are great perfect tool and you know portable you can bring them anywhere all right i, I think i have uh, I, I ended up buying like four or five more after i got those ones because they worked so well for us so ideas make relay, relay races a bit more challenging. So adding more sprinting, change of directions, okay? Find drills and exercises that have reactive and or competitive components to them and reward hard work and be engaged as the coach. So if you have somebody running it, that's something that you should really look for is making sure that they're engaged with these kids. And you know, higher energy I find is better with this. I'm not always the best at that because I'm so used to working with the older population, but anytime that I, I do work with these young kids through our kind of competitive threat group, I, I find that I really need to focus on that, all right? And it does work a lot better. 
So the PUE is the U13, it's moderate structure now, okay? Start to really focus on the fundamental strength movements, okay? I'll go over those before, uh, before I finish this slide. And then also a time where sports specific skills can become a bigger focus, okay? So this is the time, right? Especially right now, not a bad I idea to have them doing a little bit of like puck handling work on their own at home in their garage or anything like that. Right. So that that's what I kind of refer to as like the sports specific skills. And then also obviously everything that they're doing on the ice. Okay. Again, tools, agility ladders, body weight, sandbags, cones, hurdles. Then you can start in introducing things like resistance bands, light dumbbells or kettlebells. Adam initiation novice too early for that stuff. This is probably a good time for it. Okay. Or, and, and I shouldn't, there, there always could be individual situations with those really, really young kids where you might be able to use stuff like that. But I find that it's, it's rarely, if ever, going to be a good idea in a group. Okay. Ideas, the sandbags are a great way to teach things like squatting and hinging because they're an ideal external cue for proper mechanics. Okay. So this guy here on the, on the left, so this is from one of our outdoor camps that we did in the summer. And just the cue is just taking that bag, hugging it and squeezing it as hard as you can, all right? And like the biggest thing is that forces a flat neutral spine, something that is probably the most important thing when you're when you're getting teaching athletes how to squat and hinge. So all this guy's doing here is just a hinge and it's just next to perfect form. Not too many of the varsity athletes can do it that well, okay? He was a little bit of an outlier. There was a lot of ones that looked a lot worse than that, okay? But just a good example there. So the big seven in terms of fundamental strength movements, again, um, this is a combination of, of kind of from a couple different kind of gurus in the strength and conditioning industry. Okay. Dan John being one of the big ones. So the big seven is squat, hinge, push, pull, thinking for upper body movements. So a push would be like a bench press. A pull would be uh, something like a chin up. All right. A loaded carry. So if anybody's familiar with things like farmers carries, uh, suitcase carries, things like that rotation movements so like when, in terms of training rotation in the weight room i'm used to doing things like medicine ball throws and stuff like that and bracing so bracing is kind of like a, a catch-all term for resisting movement opposed to creating okay so um you know things like planks if anybody has seen those like ab wheel rollouts that's a good idea of teaching the proper way to brace um Bracing is something that an athlete needs to learn how to do like constantly in the weight room if they want to do everything with proper technique. So it's something that's super, super important and really, really ideal to teach at a young age. Okay. Um, with this one, kind of what I'm getting at, like with the don't overcomplicate things and just like meet kids where they are. It's that idea is this age is going to be probably right around that peak height velocity, peak weight velocity. So oftentimes you're going to, you're going to find something like they, in that article, they referred to it as adolescent awkwardness. All right. Where um, maybe a kid was like moved super, super well before they hit their growth spurt. And then they turn into Gumby when they, when they hit their growth spurt. Right. So it's like, it's not the end of the world. You just kind of have to retouch on everything again, be patient with them, meet them where they are be all right with stuff looking crappy, right? It's, it's never gonna always be perfect, right? You have to be patient. It's fine if it's gonna be a little bit of a struggle off the bat. If they stick with it, they'll get it. Bantam, so moderate to high structure now, all right? Take advantage of the peak weight velocity here. So this is the age where uh, the males, especially you're gonna, they're gonna be hitting that puberty phase and the amount of kind of free testosterone they have circulating through their system is just a free ticket to put on a lot of muscle mass, right? Especially if there's somebody that's slight and needs to put on that mass, all right? Ideally, you'll have a good foundation in place by now, and you can get them into a true strength and conditioning program that is a little bit more strenuous, a little bit more demanding, okay? Those big seven movements are going to remain important here and from forever on, okay? Tools now, dumbbells, kettlebells, getting into more like barbells, sprinting, change of direction drills, Olympic lifts. One thing that I should mention with Olympic lifts is, sorry, I'm going to get a little dry here, um, is that they can be introduced at a very young age, okay? Um, they are a skill. That's why it's a sport and it's of itself, right? So it's why it's an Olympic sport. Learning, learning how to do the movement with, you know, very little next to next to no weight is something that could be done, you know, su super early. 
if you have somebody that knows how to teach it. Okay. So again, it's something that, um, you know, I've, I've taken like an NCCP course on how to teach it. And it's something that I'm, you know, fairly passionate about and really enjoy it, find big value in it. But it's, it's a tricky one if, if you don't have somebody that knows what they're doing. Okay. So it's just something you just need to be careful, be careful of, but if done properly, if the athlete possesses the, the right technique and the right skill, it can be probably the most effective thing for developing power. So ideas here, the main objective is that quality precedes quantity. So what I mean there is that doing a, a full depth back squat with perfect form with lightweight and learning the movement is much more important than just trying to pile on the weight and letting your form go to garbage. Okay. And that's something that needs to be with the, with the young groups that come into the gym at the U of A. So we have a number of different sport performance groups and, and youth hockey groups and other sports. That's something that constantly needs to be reminded to kids like this. Right. And, and it's to no fault of their own. I was exactly the same way, except I didn't have somebody uh, coaching me through it. Right. I was just kind of doing anything that I knew how to do, but that was the main goal is like, I'm just going to put as much weight on this bar as I possibly can. And you know, who cares what it looks like? Definitely not what you want to see. So quality preceding quantity all the time, make certain that the athlete is performing, performing lifts safely and with as perfect form as possible. Definitely stress that big time. Okay. So we're looking at this for a bantam age player and in season, if your team is, if it's in the budget, this might be a good time to try to book some team sessions at an actual gym right? Get them in there, get them exposed to it. If, if some of them haven't seen some of this stuff before, uh, another option would be to have a qualified coach, write Programs and have the athlete follow them on their own, on their own being like, obviously with some help, right? Some help from maybe a parent or a coach or anything like that. That's always an option. Off seasons, again, if it's in the budget and rolling the athlete or the team into some sort of off season strength and conditioning program, personal training sessions, if it's in the budget, and then again, uh, parents training with kids, following a program, anything like that, right? But a very, very important time right now to have a, with the Bantam major that U15 age to have a very structured strength and conditioning program. Midget, U18, high structure now, okay? Set up for success at the next level here, okay? And still the importance of lifelong fitness for those players that maybe not be continuing on with hockey after this age group, right? That's something that, I, I always try to keep in the back of my mind, even with the varsity athletes, right. Is like, try to just get them to, to really appreciate the importance of it because that will set them up for, for a healthy life when they leave. Okay. Um, this is when you can take more of a sports specific approach, just uh, approach to some of the strength and conditioning goals. Okay. So what I mean there is that, you know, there's a certain, certain type of like a body type that's going to be the most fitting for a hockey player, right. It's not as kind of condensed as some other sports that you'd see, like, aesthetic sports and stuff like that but it's pretty established that you know you, you don't want to be a big bulky hockey player right like that's not going to be you know you're not going to see like bodybuilding looking type of dudes that are playing hockey or like really really huge jacked females or anything like that it's like a, too much muscle mass is going to be somewhat of a negative thing when we'll get to a certain point and too low of body fat is also a negative thing that's that's something that i've had to address with with certain athletes where they they're just like very focused on getting to like, um, you know, guys to like a below 7% body fat kind of thing like that. And that, that's not, that's not going to be any benefit to you. Right. So if we're looking at males, like an eight to 12% body fat females, um, usually in the 15 to 22 range, I, I may be a little bit off on that, but that's kind of the, the body type that you're looking for. You need to have a little bit of body armor, right. Muscle, a little bit of uh, a little bit of like fat, like fat, extra added tissue to just help you absorb some of the contact that you're going to get into the in the sport, right? And help you be more more robust and avoid injury. Okay, and obviously, a very strong and powerful lower body is going to be key. All right, so this is the age when you can really start to focus on some of that stuff and get a little bit more individual with some of your training goals. All right, uh, tools again very this is very similar to what i had in the in the bathroom so just what your typical gym would have in terms of like the free weights barbells dumbbells everything like that okay continue to establish the importance of the s and c piece find the best way to track progress in your situation in order to keep motivation high okay so that's going to be different depending on gyms that you're at budgets things like that right so with the players at the u of a I typically, I, I'm tracking like jump height on a weekly basis, and I'm also tracking sprint times, 
And then I'm also doing like strength testing on a monthly basis, right? So trying to get a lot of numbers in there, uh, get some more meaning behind some of their progress, okay? Always remember that the on ice component is the most, most important thing, all right? So, and like that's, that's something that I always have to keep back in my mind is like this, you know, nobody's becoming the best hockey player in the world by being in the gym all the time, right? Being on the ice, honing your game, that's the most important, all right? This part is a means to an end. It's the kind of thing if, if a player neglects it for too long, it will catch up with them. I can promise that, right? You've always heard of the people that's like, oh, I don't do any weight training or anything like that. And it's like, you could get by on your skill, but eventually that, that's going to run out. I, I promise that, okay? You look at some of these, these pros in the NHL and you know guys like Crosby, you hear about how dedicated he is to his, his training program, right? They do what they need to do. They're not going overboard with it, but they know what they need to do. They know their bodies. They keep fit. Okay. All right. And then another thing too, and I had with like, in terms of like the hockey or the sport specific goals in terms of the hips, right? The hips are a big key in here. And that's something like we can always be including in most of the age groups is a little bit of focus on that of keeping a good range of motion through the hips. All right. And um, femoral acetabular impingement is a, uh, I, I don't know what the right word for it. It's, it's starting to become a bigger and bigger issue with some, some hockey players. And, and that's, that's something where some people are getting surgeries on it. You know, I think Jesse Pugliarby on the others is a, like a big name that has had it somewhat recently, but it's something that, um, that constant motion of skating with the, the way your, your leg abducts, extends, and rotates out and comes back in a similar fashion. It's, it's a somewhat unnatural movement and that's what they feel causes these impingement patterns. A way to combat that is to make sure that you have a fairly well-rounded approach in the weight room, right? So you're not only on the ice all the time, all year round, okay? Again, that's a topic that uh, you, know, you could spend a lot of time on, um, but if you're following these kind of like sound concept with strength and conditioning, I truly believe that's a, a very good way to avoid problems like that. Okay. So kind of just finishing up with a few things of what the, what the pros do. Okay. So, um, make sure I can see both of these. Okay. So these are kind of a pet peeve of mine. All right. And I don't know if any, if any of you remember this, uh, the training video of Ryan, Ryan O'Reilly, the year that the blues won the cup, they were kind of, it was all over the place for a little while. And then the, the one with Sid, the kid on the side there with the battle ropes. And I'm not coming right out and saying that these things are just stupid exercises or, you know, that you should never do anything like this, but you, what you have to realize with stuff like this is it's just you're seeing a very very small piece of the whole okay so this video if you, if anybody has watched it with ryan o'reilly he's doing all sorts of stuff like this he's on balance beams with his hockey stick he's he's doing all sorts of very very different types of stuff okay that doesn't mean that the guy's never been under a barbell before that doesn't mean that he hasn't followed like a very regimented strength and conditioning program i don't know that but at the same time, it's like, I can guess that he's had some sort of training like that before. He's probably done some sort of strength training. It probably has a certain role within his training program, okay? Same thing with the battle ropes, right? Maybe, maybe Sid has been on those battle ropes a couple of times before, but that's not the only way he's doing conditioning, okay? Uh, it's just always recognize that when you see stuff like this. And I, I kind of feel like, like that, you know, they, they romanticize things that the pros do. It's not always realistic, okay? So this is never going to be the best thing to just throw in and have uh, a young hockey player doing for all of their training off the ice, okay? <clears throat> Same thing with our, with our boy Sid here. So we have him, um, this was a Reebok commercial from, you know, quite a few years back where we have him um, stick handling on that thing's called a BOSU ball, all right? So again, something he might do every once in a while, but I'm almost positive and I, I know that the, the guy that trains, I, I don't know him, but I, I know of the guy who trains this guy and he's a very well-respected person in the strength and conditioning industry. So I guarantee the majority of his time is spent on stuff like this, right? He's doing a very functional single leg squat on a box. He's probably getting under some weight fairly regularly. He's doing what, he's doing what he needs to do to maintain his strength and power, okay? That's the one thing is like, when you're looking at certain stuff like that, it's like, think about how much force they're putting into the ground 
All right. And that's when they are putting high force into the ground, that is the type of thing that will produce results, produce results in terms of strength and power. Okay. Again, I'm not trying to poo poo on that type of stuff and say that it has no place at all, but just know that that's one part of the whole. Okay. And then just one of the last slides here. And I'm sure a lot of you have watched the last dance. Um, I, I know I watched it. I really enjoyed it. But probably the most disappointing part about that documentary is that they didn't give this guy up top his due. So this guy's name's Al Vermeil, and he's probably one of the most famous strength and conditioning coaches ever. And he was the strength and conditioning coach on that team for every single championship they won and Jordan was there. And I don't think he's on that documentary once, right? So it just kind of goes to show you that Jordan had complete control over that. And he just only showed his personal trainer. But this guy was, he was the the brains behind anything that was happening, strength and conditioning. And, you know, he was doing stuff with those guys, like those, you know, guys that were almost seven feet. He was having them hang power, clean front squat, do very, very heavy resistance training. And he, they were doing it all year round. Right. And I don't, I don't know the exact injury stats or what they were, but from what I recall and hearing from this is that they were a very robust team. Right. And it was all thanks to that, that guy there. So just to kind of close things off, um, this was something that I was kind of hoping to have like a bit of a summer summarizing statement, all right? So in the early years, you need to find a way to disguise the development of fundamental movement skills and strength through methods that make it enjoyable for the young player. As the athlete ages and develops an appreciation for the importance of the off-ice training, it becomes less about entertaining them and more about developing a culture centered around work ethic and movement quality Try to establish the off-ice component as necessary in order for them to reach their full potential on the ice. Some will enjoy it, some will not, but the key is that they understand the why. Okay, that's it for me. Thank you very much for everybody that came on here today on St. Patty's Day. All right, um, <clears throat> any questions, feel free to email me, email me at that joel at competitivefred.com. Uh, I'm on social media, so obviously you can get in touch with me on there too. My company is also on social media on both Instagram and, tw and Twitter. And then our website is at the bottom there as well. And the references in case anybody wants to uh, check out any of that stuff that any of the articles or any of the pictures that I posted on. That's awesome. Thanks so much, Joel. Um, and we've got a couple questions in the, in the chat here. Um, we'll, I'll just pull them up one sec. Um, First one here from, uh, from Tyler. Um, what type of conditioning programs do you have through competitive thread uh, in season or off season? Well, thanks for asking Tyler. Um, yeah, through that, um, right now doing a lot of basically, like I used to call it remote work, but kind of bring the gym to you type of stuff. Okay. So any of the work that I, that I do with any minor hockey teams, um, uh, I'm basically, I have like those sandbags and a whole bunch of different types of gear. So typically what we like to do is, is have an outdoor setup is ideal when the weather permits, but some sort of open gymnasium space. So any of those rec centers that have the indoor soccer courts are always like a really good option, but usually on the team to find the space. And then I come to you and can pretty much do any type of session in terms of like, uh, I usually like to be like a well-rounded kind of, uh, speed agility strength conditioning session okay and then through competitive thread i would also kind of like what i talked about i'll program for people um that type of thing um send send stuff them that way and then you know try to make it as comprehensive as possible in terms of video links and, and easy to follow and making myself available for questions and kind of like video feedback if if kids want the an exercise video and, and send it to me to get feedback that way. Uh, a lot of stuff can be done remotely, uh, you know, in terms of uh, an actual place where I'm offering strength and conditioning through competitive thread, nothing like that right now, but might be coming down the pipe. Hopefully, hopefully something like that will be established in the, in the future. Awesome. We've got lots of questions here. You're busy. <laughs> um, there's a little bit longer one here from, uh, from Justin. Um, thanks for the presentation. Very informative. Can you speak a bit to cycles leading up to competition? For example, finding a performance peak, whether it be for a game on a weekly basis or leading up to a tournament on a more long-term basis. Is there any insight you can provide 
as to if a team should be pacing up in anticipation of these events or, uh, sorry, one sec. Or is there a benefit to front loading higher intensity training earlier in a week or season? And these are specific a bit more to U15, U18 level players. Okay, so that's, um, Justin, that's probably something that could be pretty applicable to a schedule that the university hockey players would follow. So um, you're, you're spot on in the sense that the week should be front loaded. Um, so if I, you know, give an example, like with the university hockey, one of the the most ideal things about that setting is their schedule. All right. So they always know Friday, Saturday games, that's not going to change until it gets to the end of the year where the, the national tournament hap tournament happens. So in terms of on ice perspective, like, you know, oftentimes uh, with, with how I find about a, have a lot of conversations with the pandas coach about, you know, how we can structure practice differently and like reading weeks and stuff like that. But typically in a normal week, you know, Monday, Tuesday practices are, are going to be your kind of higher volume, longer days. Um, you know, a lot, of, it depends on the coach and depends on their philosophy, but, you know, typically maybe on a, on a Monday, that's going to be a battle day, right. Where it's like very high intensity, one-on-one -on -one battles in a lot of different situations. Tuesday is still going to be pretty tough with a lot of type of like higher tempo um, flow type of work to the practice. Right. And then as they get towards the end of the week in the Wednesday, Thursday, that's your low intensity, maybe more skill focused um, systems play, stuff like that, where um, that athlete isn't getting as much of a training stimulus on the ice. In terms of the off ice stuff, um, I've tried a few different approaches. The thing that I find that works the best is to go a strength and a power split. So they'll do a strength workout on the Monday. So usually that's going to be dominated by two like big lifts. So big core lifts. So something like that, you know, two to three, I should say. So a lot of times they're going to do an Olympic lift. They're going to do something like a, a fairly heavy front squat and then a bench press that's fairly heavy as well. And then sprinkled in with some accessory work as well. And then on the power day, that's when they're going to do more lighter loaded speed oriented type of work. Okay. Um, typically with that, it's like, the power based stuff that you're doing off the ice. Um, there's something called post activation potentiation. And what that is, it's like that type of work can actually kind of, uh, you know, prime your nervous system. And sometimes it's like, you, you hear of people sometimes even doing workouts like that the day of a game. Uh, and like some, some people feel that they get a benefit from that. It just kind of wakes up the nervous system a little bit and allows it to be a, a bit more powerful. But the idea is that if you do something like that later in the week, there's very, very little chance that it's going to have fatigue that's going to go into the weekend and some chance that it might actually enhance your, your ability to perform. All right. Uh, so like some of the stuff that you're mentioning too, it's like almost sounds like you're talking about like peaking. Um, and, and that's something that I, I think is, is a little bit trickier to do in a team sport like hockey, you know, peaking training phases is something for like, you know, track and field is something that that's huge in, right? Where they're going to have a very, very structured plan in terms of how they're going to manipulate intensity and volume throughout a year so that they're peaked ready for that like main competition, whether that be an Olympic games or at the university level, it's going to be like a national championship, things like that. Right. With, with a hockey sport, it's like, if you're looking at it in terms of a week to week basis, I think that's a nice way to look at it. Okay. And then, um, in the, in the off season, a little bit different too, where you would probably backload the week instead, where you don't have games on the weekend, you put your hardest workouts at the end of the week. Hope that answers it. I could go on and on forever about that question for sure. No, that was a perfect response. Thanks, Joel. Uh, one sec here. Um, one, and one here from, from Ryan. Um, how long do you re recommend a session go on for? Um, so yeah, that's a good question, Ryan. Like, I, it kind of depends on the time of the year. Um, so in season with, uh, with, again, I'll use varsity a lot for, for the examples, but like in season for any sport really would be typical. So, um, doing, if you have a couple sessions a week, you probably don't want those to go any more longer than 45 minutes, right? 30 to 45 minutes is a good range. Um, when you're in an off season, more on the range of like 60, 90 minutes max, like I, I'll never have an athlete in the gym for like two, three hours. Like the, the kind of thing with that, it's like, um, 
from a physiological standpoint and nutritional standpoint, like unless you're bringing like a meal with you into the gym, it's there's probably not going to be a lot of benefit to just going that long and you're going to run out of energy and you're going to run out of attention, that type of thing. So off season, 60 to 90 in season, 30 to 45, right. In your guys' situations, if you're throwing like one um, off ice workout a week, maybe on a, on a week that you don't have games, then it's fine to go a little bit longer in season, right? So closer to an hour, an hour and 15, but, um, never really anything long. Awesome. Uh, it's quite a few here. Sorry. That's, no, that's yeah. like a, that sandbag one from Candace. So, um, yeah. so I got those, I got those ones that I showed the pictures of Candace from, uh, Flamin. Um, and fitness um they have like a few locations around the city i think i picked them up from that location on yellowhead um those are the lightest ones in that brand so they're 10 kilograms to like 22 pounds um when i've played around with those with some of those age groups they're you know if if you wanted to try to use something like that with like young young like novice age kids i i don't know if i would recommend it like if you did use it it would need to be lighter than that like so something that's like closer to like five or 10 pounds. Um, and I'm pretty sure you can get them that light. You can make them on your own too. Like that is hundred percent something you can make on your own out of like, if you can find, um, old tire tubing from like a big tire, like, so whether that's like a tractor tire or something like that, and you know, some sort of thing to like fasten it closed, but I've seen a lot of people, uh, make them on their own and they, they work good. Right. So a great little training tool to, uh, to introduce kids to some of that stuff. The, the ones from Flamin are nice though, because they have like a, like six different sets of handles on them. So you can do like, you could teach like power cleans with them, like, you know, do like bicep curls and rows and everything with them. So they're very versatile. Mm -hmm. awesome. Should uh, goalies do anything different than player? Yeah. <laughs> um, so my, like I would say early on, in in development so like we were looking at some of those initiations through like peewee age groups i would say no um you know i think obviously there's some value for them doing some sports specific stuff on the ice for sure um right because obviously like in terms of what they need to do is is uh very very different than a player uh as as they get older and like kind of as i mentioned on that slide in the bantam midget age groups that's kind of when you can you can start to dig in a little bit deeper with some more positional specific type of stuff. And so with goalies, like I, I find one thing I would recommend if you, if you have a young goalie that's passionate and, and really wants to get better, make sure that they're flexible and mobile. Right. So if they're, if they're really like, like, you know, uh, like really, really stiff. And like, I, I've seen that with like, uh, like a few kids that I've worked with in the younger age groups that that's something that, I would 100% recommend getting into a routine of, right? And, and that's one thing like I, I totally forgot to mention this on some of the slides. When, when it comes to resistance training in terms of like, you know, when I talked about how it's a means to an end and like some athletes will like it more than others. The biggest thing, so like a lot of like strength and fitness people will talk about KPIs, key performance indicators. So uh, most of the times with a strength and conditioning program, your biggest KPI is attendance and consistency. Like just do it consistently, right? And that's the kind of thing. It's like, you're gonna have days where you don't want to, right? And like, sometimes you're gonna need a break, but it's like, you don't wanna go for weeks and months on end without doing anything. Like consistency is a big thing. So with goalies, yeah, try to, try to get some flexibility and mobility work in like very early on. And then as they get older, I do start to play around with more kind of intricate stuff in terms of like things that they're doing with their hips, different types of like rotational movements around the lower body to mirror some of the movements that they're doing. Um, you know, there, there's kind of a fine line there in terms of sports specificity, like you don't want to get too, too um, outside the realm of what the basics are, but there's definitely a few things that you can do. Um, and then in terms of conditioning, sometimes with them, a little bit more aerobic conditioning is probably necessary with some of them because of the nature of their position where they're one of the only players on the ice that that's out there for the whole game. And, uh, you know, that ability to recover between high intensity efforts becomes a little bit more important for them. Uh, what drills exercises would you recommend for younger age groups to improve coordination? So 
like with that, like those, those agility ladders are a great thing to throw into the mix. And then a lot of things with like catching and throwing is good too. Like sometimes with the younger groups, I've just like literally had like tennis balls and just had them like progressively get further, further away from each other, say that they're only allowed to throw and catch with their left hand, right? Things like that. So just being creative with, with certain things and like through games is like other types of games. So have them as the athletes get older, you can challenge them a little bit more like ultimate Frisbee might not go over so well with a group of novice kids, but you know, peewee bantam, like that's something that can definitely help coordination, right. Or um, have them on like a beach volleyball court or like anything like that. Trying to find, like, I like doing that with just the varsity kids too. Like they, they love doing that. Sometimes if we have like a session in the gym, like playing volleyball or basketball or spike ball or setting up the badminton net, that's like a great way to just throw something different at them touch, touch on some of those fundamental movement skills and help improve in coordination. So lots of different things like that too, but agility ladders, like something that's going to involve throwing catching, I think would be one of the biggest ones. So strength is a big focus for all ages, but how does flexibility fit in? So that's something, um, you know, if you, if, if you get the slides, you can kind of look back at those, those graphics that I put in there. So it's, it's definitely something that, that plays into it, but it's the, the flexibility. So it's like flexibility is, you know, being able to have like a, a wide range of motion amongst your, like among your joints. So like, we you know, talking about like hips, shoulders, thoracic spine being the big ones, mobility and like kind of stability or like strength through that range of motion becomes very important too. So it's like, it's not necessarily going to be essential that you know, an athlete like a hockey player can do the split say, right? They just need to have a certain range of motion that allows them to get into the positions that they need to, to be like an effective skater to, to shoot a puck hard, right? So it's definitely essential. And I kind of like how I mentioned on that, that thing with the goalies is like, it's great to have it as something that a kid does every day, right? So it's like watching TV, have a little stretching routine that they're doing every day, right? get your team into the habit of stretching after practices, right? Any, so this, this is another thing, if anybody's probably maybe heard of like, you know, stretching can reduce your power output. I, I'm sure there's a few people that have heard that before. And like, that was a big thing in the research for a long time. And again, like, sure. If I'm going to hold like a quad stretch for like two minutes and then get into a bar and try to do like a one RM back squat, it might negatively affect me. But if I stretch in the dressing room, uh, before I go out for my off ice warm up and then come back in, do an on ice warm up, and then 20 minutes later the game starts, I can 100% guarantee that that stretching is not going to negatively affect you at all. Any negative effects that possibly could have happened are going to have dissipated a long, long time ago. Okay. So, and like you know, stretching and warm ups on the ice. And like I know there's guys avoiding that for a while, but yeah, just make it as like a, a routine, right? Try to try to get it in every day or you know, five, six days a week, things like that. Awesome. Any anybody else have any into input into the chat? Got a fan there with Tyler. <laughs> yeah there's a I, I recognize a few names on here so a few guys that i played with and a few buddies so thanks for coming on everybody yeah well that's awesome well i think we'll uh we'll end it here but yeah joel thanks so much for coming and sharing that information that's that's awesome we haven't had anything like that yet and i think it was really good a little snippet and snapshot for all of the levels of coaches we have and just a little plug for joel here but i you know i think when you look for coaches whether they be on ice or off ice you want to find the ones that are constantly educating themselves and improving and certainly Joel is one of those guys that's always looking to find ways to make himself better and contribute to the academic side and the, the learning side so um, lots of great information from him um, if you have any uh, questions certainly reach out but uh, from Hockey Edmonton thank you again Joel really appreciate your your time today no thank you so much for having me on and thanks everybody for for coming and checking it out appreciate it